Hi, and welcome to part two of this presentation on contact modeling using SolarWorks simulation. My name is Ramesh Lakshmipati, and I'm a senior technical sales specialist with DASA System SolarWorks Corporation. Let's get started. So earlier I talked a little bit about the source and target. Uh, so the way SolarWorks simulation differentiates the two entity selections uh, for a contact pair uh, is, is the source and the target definition. So one, of, one way of looking at them is to assume the source acts on the target entity. So it attempts to project the source entities onto the target and it can actually make a difference which entities get assigned to which. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> basically the choice of source and target is unimportant in some of the cases. For example, if you're selecting uh, allow penetration, it doesn't really matter what the source and target is. If you're selecting bonded contact with compatible mesh options, the choice of the source and target becomes irrelevant. And same thing if you select no penetration with a node-to-node -node option, literally here you're assuming that the faces are always going to be uh, initially touching and also touching throughout the deformation process. So the choice of source and target can really become critical to both convergence and, and solution time for all the other contact conditions, including a shrink fit condition. So you can define geometric entities. That geometric entity could be a face, a vertex, or an edge in, uh, you know, with, that you can specify in, as part of the source selection or the target selection. And both the source and target selections can include multiple entities. So it doesn't have to be only one face at a time. You can have two or three or more faces selected in your source definition and multiple entities selected likewise in the target definition. All right, so when you're using the bonded contact with the incompatible setting, there are some common situations that typically you might run into. So for example, you might have overlapping surfaces or faces where you're trying to bond using, using the incompatible option or interfering edges or faces uh, with or without a clearance. So for example, if you have a face on face type of situations as illustrated here, what happens is the source selection, which is face A is projected onto the target selection, which is phase B. And the whole idea here is to get a, a common projected area so that the program behind the scenes can actually use special constraint equations to bond the nodes and elements between those two uh, uh, phases of interest. Very similarly, between a beam and a face, it's important to understand that each beam node is gonna be projected onto the surface. And if that's successful, a bonded condition results uh, between that beam node and the and, and the target face selection. Now you can see that on this picture over here, uh, there are a couple of nodes on the left side that are that are marked with an X, simply because of the fact that those beam nodes uh, cannot find uh, the face. The normal projection fails, and so the bonded contact is not created between be those beam nodes and the target surface. So the same scenario holds true when you're projecting a beam onto an edge or an, a shell edge onto another shell edge and so on. Now, when you have a clearance, that clearance cannot be large compared to the global element size. So there is a general guideline where the ratio of the clearance to the element size on the target select, selected face should be less than one. If that scenario does not hold true, the, the bonded condition will not happen. So in terms of source selection, you can select faces, edges, and vertices. And for the target, only faces and edges are actually allowed for selection uh, with respect to the bonded contact with the incompatible uh, setting. Now, when you have a compatible mesh, which is the default condition all the time, uh, it's always a good practice to first try if that setting actually results in a successful mesh because the bonded condition or the bonded compatible mesh always gives good results all the time. However, when you have when you run into a scenario where you have to end up using an incompatible mesh, uh, a couple of things to remember is that uh, uh, in, in your study properties, there are settings for the incompatible bonding. Uh, so one of them is called simplified, which is the default setting. And that's typically what is called as a node-based contact where 
you have a node on the source phase being tied up using in the internal constraint equations to an element on the uh, target phase. So you can see that that can actually result in some unrealistic results uh, in situations where you might have some, some sort of auto plane shear happening and things like that. So in scenarios like that, it's always recommended to switch to the more accurate solution. In fact, for any, in, in any problem that you're solving using an incompatible bonding option, the recommended uh, selection is more accurate setting as shown here because that uses an element-based contact or in other words, a mortar bonding technique that actually uh, ties up each element on the source of, um, entity to the elements on the target entity and vice versa. So it's more robust, more, uh, you know, more accurate and results in, um, uh, and, and results in a solution that's more realistic in nature. So in in, in, in summary, general, some of the general guidelines for con bonded contact with the uh, incompatible setting. Uh, so the first thing to understand is that constraint equations are actually used behind the scenes to match the displacements and rotations of the, of the two parts. And while bonding solids and shells, it's always a good practice to use shells as the source uh, selection and solids solids or the solid faces as the, as the target selection. Now, when, when, wherever you might suspect stress concentration uh, or, or in situations where you might have stress concentration at the bonded intersection, and that's critical. Uh, it's it's a good practice to actually have a fine mesh in the in, in that region. Now the results local to the bonded contact deteriorate as the difference in stiffness between the parts increases. So in those scenarios as well, the local mesh refinement is suggested uh, because that's going to help improve the solution. It's always advisable for the mesh and the source set to have more nodes in the target set if the meshes are incompatible. So that way, what this means is if you have, you know, you can always refine the mesh uh, in, in on the uh, source entities rather than the target entities to get a more reasonable, more accurate solution. So when it comes to no penetration contact, so there are some general guidelines for the geometry selection. So let's talk about the target geometry selection with respect to the source geometry selection. The target geometry should be stiffer of the two parts. It should be the flatter and the larger surface area. It can be certainly meshed coarser than the source. No sharp corners or fillets are allowed in the area of contact. The source entity can be vertices, edges, and faces, while the target entity can be only faces when it comes to using a no penetration contact. Now, there might be situations where you might end up selecting vertices or edges as the source entities. And for those scenarios, the mathematical formulation that's allowed is the node to surface contact only. So if you switch to surface to surface and, and try to OK on the selections, you're going to get this message where it says vertices and edges are only allowed as source entities for surface contact and bonding element condition only. So keep this in mind. Now here's a scenario where the red body is marked as the source and the blue body is marked as the target. Now this, when you're defining no penetration contact between the two bodies, uh, ideally in this scenario, you would want to switch the source and the target geometry selections. Just because of the fact that the target has a sharp edge, and that's usually not recommended uh, you know, for, for the target geometry selections. So you can either make a change in the geometry as shown here, where you can get rid of that edge and, and basically fill it that sharp edge and then select um, the three target faces, the flat faces and the fillet faces as shown here, and select the source face in your contact definition. Now, it's always recommended to group as many selections using a single contact definition of, uh, if possible. So in this case, for example, instead of creating you know, three contact sets where I select the source face and select each of the target faces in each of the contact definitions, I can simply have one contact definition where I select the source face. In this case, it's just one single face of interest. Then I select the three faces for my target um, geometry selection. 
and so that way uh, it, it actually helps the solver it, it actually likes it much better than having three different contact conditions trying to simulate the same scenario now in terms of contact types the no penetration contact is probably the most commonly used uh, contact uh, it is a primary reason to use contact it defines regions in the model that cannot pass through each other so you can have faces that might are geometric entities that might have an initial clearance so they might be touching each other initially and then later on doing deformation they can separate out the next one is a bonded bonded is again like we have discussed so far it welds or glues entities together okay so again it's it's a scenario where you don't want that the entities of interest translate or rotate with respect to each other and simply transfer the loads so that's where the bonded contact uh, actually comes in handy. Then you have free or no interaction. This is kind of a very rarely used uh, uh, situation or, or option rather. Um, and it's really in, in scenarios where you would actually want to use a global, uh, it, it actually makes it a lot more easier to use a global contact as a free condition and then uh, you know apply local conditions uh, local contact conditions to enforce any kind of physical interaction between various geometric entities in your model. The shrink fit is again a nice way to simulate press fit or interference fit interactions. So usually it's for simulating any, any type of a pre-stress condition, uh, especially when you're dealing with threaded connections and so on. This can actually be a very uh, easy to use option to simulate a very complex physics uh, you know, that, that actually happens in real life. The virtual wall is another great contact condition. So again, like the name implies, virtual wall means uh, you basically uh, use this sort of, you know, uh, 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 you're trying to simulate a ground or a wall or a large flat rigid surface without actually modeling the geometry of that rigid uh, uh, ground or a rigid wall. So instead, you end up using a reference plane that mimics the ground and the wall and you can also account for low, any kind of local compliance, for example, any kind of wall stiffness. So the wall that you're trying to simulate uh, contact with can actually be a completely rigid entity, or you can actually go ahead and specify some sort of stiffness parameters as well. All right, so what are the, one of the new features that was introduced in, in the 2016 version was sorry 2015 version was what what's called a self contact so self contact is when you have the same geometric entity coming and touching each other uh, touching it touching with it itself during the all right so let's talk about self contact self contact is I get a great feature implemented in, in, in the 2015 release of SOLIDWORKS simulation. So it's usually in situations where you have the same uh, geometric entity coming and touching with itself during the deformation process. So which means a face can actually come into contact with itself and it's applicable for linear and nonlinear static analysis where you have, you have large deflection. So for example, you have an example of, a, here illustrated an example of a bellows where a single uh, surface that might actually come into contact with each ear with, with itself during the deformation process or you might have some sort of a, a, a compression spring you can see that it's a just a helical surface and that surface might actually contact itself during the deformation process so earlier earlier to having this particular feature in the software uh, you would have to break down the uh, surface into or split the surface into uh, into multiple um, multiple entities or you know split the body into multiple bodies to enforce the, and, and then use a no penetration contact to simulate a, a behavior like this but again now you have a simple checkbox in your contact definition that allows to uh, takes care of the situation in a simple easy to use fashion all right so that concludes this presentation Stay tuned for more or similar presentations on the Simulation YouTube channel. I'll see you next time. Thanks and have a great day.